He is the UN um, NC Longleaf Applied Scientist with the Nature Conservancy. And he's giving his presentation on the ecology and management of the longleaf pine forests. So he's going to talk about plants and animals that are encountered, as well as the management and conservation actions needed to protect and restore this forest. He will also be discussing some opportunities for students interested in entering the field of conservation and opportunities for collaboration between the Nature Conservancy and American Indian tribes in North Carolina. So thank you for joining us, um, Jeff, and please, you have the floor. Awesome, thanks, Elizabeth. I really appreciated you hosting me down on the campus uh, earlier this year to, to give this presentation and, and appreciate everyone uh, tuning in remotely to, to see this uh, remote version of it. And uh, it's... Uh, of it that remain in this area um, rival you know areas of the rainforest and other places in terms of just interesting species the diversity uh, um, of, of, of life that we have here and, and the uniqueness of it uh, is really special I want to kind of share that with you today in, the, in in a journey that kind of is goes is taken through the eyes of a, uh, a gopher frog so I'm gonna share this uh, let me know. Uh, are, are, are is everyone able to see um, see the uh, see the slides now? Um, okay, I got a thumbs up. Perfect. Great. Uh, so yeah, uh, once again, uh, my name is Jeff Marcus, I'm applied scientist with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, I've been living in Sand Hills about the last 21 years, and I want to recognize uh, Brady Beck, a biologist with the Wildlife Resources Commission, whose videos uh, are featured. Uh, a lot in this in this presentation. So uh, this journey that uh, that we're going to take today is going to be following a Carolina gopher frog. This is a, a, a Carolina gopher frog right here, shown uh, given its uh, defensive posture, which is kind of a, a cool thing when it's uh, when it's either startled or, or afraid or, or such. It'll kind of throw its hands up in in front of its face like this and. It's a really neat and interesting behavior. Although I've always been kind of interested, is this more of a kind of a posture of, well, I'm going to get ready to put up my dukes and defend myself, or, or is it really more of a, I'm going to kind of cover my head and hope that uh, all the world's problems will uh, will pass me by uh, and that this will all be over soon. So uh, anyway, it's really interesting how they uh, they do that defensive posture. But our story begins here on Sandhills Game Land. So this is uh, just up the road from, uh, from UNC Pembroke. Uh, over, you can see Sand Hills Game Land is about 65,000 acres of, of, of state-owned land that, that stretches across. A research study that was happening on, on, the, uh, on the game land. So what you see here is a drift fence this uh, um, line of, 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 you know, essentially sort of uh, riprap material goes along, sits between the uplands, the forest, and a wetland that's sitting over here. And as a frog is walking, you know, hopping along, trying to get to, to the wetland where he's trying to go, it hits this fence and has to kind of go to the side to, to hop along to try and get around it. And it hops, hops along until it falls into one of our five gallon buckets here, at which time it's retrieved by our, our, our trusty uh, field technician who uh, takes them out, takes a, a mug shot of this animal. The reason we were doing this is because um, an interesting fact is that the frog's lips, gopher frog lips, kind of like the, the tails of the flukes of a lot of the, you know, whales, other things, have unique patterns on them. We thought that we could actually identify these individuals based on the patterns of their lips, which seemed like a great idea until you've got to flip through a a book about you know 100 different frog photos trying to match up the squirming thing in, in, in your hand with uh, you know with these images uh, it wasn't wasn't as easy as uh, initially thought it might be um, but anyway once it's got its mug shot it's then uh, adorned with some jewelry so you can see this uh, tech is holding the head of the frog here the legs are sticking out this way this is a belt 
that goes around its midsection and behind it here is a radio transmitter. So there's a radio transmitter, which an antenna gives off a little signal that should be picked up and, and you can then follow and see where this thing goes. So that's how uh, we learned about this. And we're gonna start our journey at its stump hole. So this is, uh, you know, when we think about frogs, uh, often sort of the typical thing we think about is, is, is a, uh, uh, you know, frog living in a pond, you know, living in, in, in the water. And while these frogs do go to the water, really most of their lives are actually spent up on land and they're actually spent under the ground in the land. On um, what we call a pad, sort of a cleared area of, of, of straw and vegetation and where what it's sitting on top of is, is, is a stump hole and, and this little dark spot right in the middle here, that's the hole in which it will sit in there and it will ambush insects as they go and walk them by on that little cleared area. And spending time underground is, is actually really critical for these frogs where they can, you know, hibernate, spend the, uh, you know, stay, stay warm enough in the, in the winter where they won't freeze, stay cooler uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the summer, avoid fire and predators. And these stump holes, so this, this area that it's sitting used to be where a, a longleaf tree was. You can see a little remnant of the tree here, and there's the stump hole. And these stumps are really important for these frogs, because despite its name being gopher frog, um, it actually is not a particularly good digger. Um, fun fact, the, the, the gopher frog gets its name not from its digging ability, but from its association, affiliation with the gopher tortoise which is a species also found in the Longleaf Forest further uh, south uh, of here. We don't have them in North Carolina, but it's the gopher tortoise that's named for its, its digging ability. It is these, you know, good 30 foot long tunnels that are, that are inhabited by, by gopher frogs and other things. And it's for that digging ability that it's named for the common gopher. The gopher of which, of course, uh, appeared in a key role with, uh, um, in, the, in the 80s comedy Caddyshack with Bill Murray, who in turn appeared in the 1998 thriller Wild Things with Kevin Bacon. So you can get from gopher frog to Kevin Bacon in just four degrees of separation, which uh, I think gets a little off topic, but sort of brings us uh, back to uh, our original premise, which is that these, uh, the, these, these stumps are important. And to get a sense of it, uh, you can see here what a longleaf stump looks like underground. So these longleaf trees, one of the things they're known for is putting down these big, long, you know, long, deep tap roots um, that helps give them stability, get, helps them to find, you know, water and nutrients in these poor sandy soils. Um, it makes them more stable. That's why longleaf are often the trees that are left standing after a hurricane blows over and other trees are tipped over. Um, but when the tree dies, this big, long, deep underground root system and those lateral roots um, can, uh, can get opened up, particularly when they burn. So that, that, that tree dies and you have a stump, acts as sort of a wick when fire comes in, the fire burns down, burns out the, uh, the bottom and creates all these underground chambers uh, and tunnels that, that the frogs and other things go in. And so like I say, it's not just those gopher frogs, you'll find small mammals, other types of amphibians like tiger salamanders, chorus frogs, lots of snakes. These stump holes are really important, and that's where that's where our frog, uh, the gopher frog in the study, was uh, was spending most of its days just sitting there. It'll actually spend about eight months of the year sitting in this hole, and it's sitting there looking out on a scene that probably looks something like this, dreaming about whatever uh, whatever gopher frogs dream about, uh, waiting for the right conditions. So the right conditions are waiting for it to be the winter time when that pond will fill with water and they can start to breed. Now that pond is a couple of miles away from this site. And how it knows that the pond is full and the conditions are right to breed is a mystery. We have no idea, but somehow it has in its little brain the knowledge that it's waiting, it's waiting and waiting, not time, not time, not time. When the signals get right and it says, okay, now it is, it's going to go and it's going to emerge from that hole. And it's gonna start its journey and it's gonna go through an area, uh, um, an area that looks, uh, looks a lot like this. This is a you know, longleaf forest. So this frog is hopping along now, not at the speed, but just you know, a little six inches above the ground. And it's gonna make this journey of a few miles um, 
only be able to see, you know, just, you know, six inches in front of its face, perhaps, as it's, uh, as it's hopping, um, only traveling at night when it's raining, when it's warmer than 50 degrees. So all those conditions have to be right. That's the signal to go. And it's able to navigate under those conditions to go almost in a straight line towards this breeding pond and then back again at the end of that season to that, to that stump. So as it's hopping, it's not able to make that journey all in one night because it's such a big dis distance. So when it turns either uh, turns daylight um, or it gets too cold or it stops raining that evening, it's going to stop for the night. And so on this night, it's stopped underneath this, this sort of at the base of this tree is a little bit curious as to, to what's going on there and is actually uh, hearing a bit of a racket going on. And what's going on is that this is a cavity tree for a red cockaded woodpecker. And let me ask uh, Elizabeth just quickly, are you able to hear sound with that video or do I need to uh, select to share sound? I'm not able to come up with this really quickly. I'm going to just go on with it unless anyone in the in the room remembers how to do that. Um, let's uh, let's go on. So uh, we don't have the uh, sound, but you'll just have to uh, envision uh, uh, some squeaking of these uh, red cockaded woodpeckers. But you can see an adult feeding a young here. Um, that young that's inside the nest there is a young male that has a red patch on the top of the head. That's actually not the, the name, the red cockaded woodpecker comes from a little patch of, uh, of, of, of red behind the ear. You can see on the adult, there really isn't much red to speak of. So the name's a little misleading because people think of seeing woodpeckers with a red. You know, red cockaded woodpeckers are mostly black and white. Um, a little bit, but they're nesting in these live longleaf pine trees that have the uh, that are usually are 80 years old or older, and they have the sap that runs down the front in order to uh, discourage snakes and other predators from climbing up the tree. So uh, those uh, um, those red cockaded woodpecker is one of the uh, important parts of the longleaf pine ecosystem, and. Our, uh, our our frog question is sitting here at the base of this tree, and if you can see it, I don't know if you can make it out in this image, but it's right in the center of the image. His face is facing this way. We have you can see an eye, you can see a snout, you can see just a little bit of that uh, that that radio transmitter on him here. Um, and when they're waiting to kind of move, you know, to the next uh, time, they don't have these stump holes to get in because they're not at their home base, so they'll stay tucked under a little tuft of wire grass and. Uh, Um, nowhere else on the planet, um, variety of different other uh, species there. And one reason why that ground cover is important, not just for the diversity of itself, but also um, to help uh, our gopher frog avoid predators, because the only fine forest is filled with things like these red foxes here, also different owls, hawks, um, raccoons, opossums, lots of things that would love to eat a gopher frog. And when he's sitting there in a forest that has all of this ground cover, all these grasses and everything growing up, you can't see that that frog sitting there. The same thing would go for, uh, you know, if it's a quail running on the ground or a snake. When you're hidden underneath all of this grassy uh, habitat, you can stay well hidden, and that's that's critical to stay uh, uh, to avoid predators. 
Um, some other species that, that depend on that, I mentioned bobwhite quail. Here you can see again, right in the center of your, of your image, the head of a quail hen. Here's her eye, her, 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 her um, beak is pointing this way and she's sitting on, uh, sitting on some eggs um, uh, there. And this is the image of a Bachman sparrow nest that's sitting underneath. This is actually a tuft of a longleaf pine grass stage on the grass. All these ground nesters are really critical to keep their eggs safe by hidden by all of that important ground cover. Uh, this Bachman sparrow is, is another really neat and unique uh, species associated with the longleaf pine forests. And uh, here's uh, an image of it singing. Uh, unfortunately, if your audio isn't uh, working, I'll have to maybe uh, uh, mimic it for you. It song sounds something like a... So hear it again. Really a poor imitation, but you know, it's uh, best I can do for you here. Uh, anyway, neat little bird, spends a lot of its time on the ground, you know, nesting on the ground, foraging on the ground. It'll, when you spook, it'll fly to the ground and run and act more like a mouse than, than a bird. And fire is a really critical thing for, for maintaining its habitat. Uh, we, we completed a, a, a study with this, uh, uh, of this species across the state. And one of the key findings was really the majority, almost all the sites where Bachman sparrows were detected had some evidence of recent fire. So it really needs fire to rejuvenate, to, to, to uh, resuscitate the habitat and to create those conditions that are needed. So we often think of fire as a destructive force. And maybe one of the takeaways you might have from today's presentation is to learn about how we, ways that, that fire can be really a force of renewal and rebirth for the longleaf pine forest. So one way that brings about that rebirth is allowing for the, the regeneration of, 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 of new species. So this is a, a, a pine seed from a started to germinate and create a new seedling. Um, many species of not just the longleaf pine trees, but uh, these grasses, they need that, that, that bare mineral soil in order to germinate and, and uh, to, to start the next generation. Where you have a fire suppressed forest, like this one that you see here, um, you can still see some of these longleaf trees in there, but now what's happened is you've, 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 you know, without fire, a lot of the hardwoods, um, will start to grow up in that mid-story and all the needles that, that come down without burning off those, those, those needles and the leaves, it starts to build up this thick layer of, 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 of dead and decaying leaves and needles, and it prevents those seeds from, from germinating on the ground. So actually, if you look at the ground level here, you're not seeing any young longleaf trees starting to sprout. You're also not seeing a lot of grasses. You're not seeing a lot of wildflowers it suppresses the growth of all those things. So you're not getting all those key plants that are growing up there and it'd be a lot easier for a predator to kind of see those things and pick them off and they would not be uh, as, as, as well protected. So fire is a critical role in this in this ecosystem, and that's one of the uh, the patterns that um, the way that historically uh, you know fire was on on this landscape was either through lightning strikes and Native American burning um, was pretty common, and and these days a lot of it is is is, is uh, happens when natural resource agencies uh, and 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 or, or conservation organizations or other landowners will do prescribed fire. And so here's kind of what that looks like, lighting some of the fire through the woods. Um, and these fires, it's not, again, what you might think of or see on the news when you see big catastrophic wildfires or the fires burning up through the top of the canopy. Um, we're not trying to create those kind of fires. That are not the typical fires that are created. So once a fire gets going, and what you're typically going to see is something like this. will be about maybe three to, to, to five feet tall. Um, it's burning through that shrub layer and going to try and uh, kill some of those shrubs to, to keep the, the woody vegetation, the uh, you know new hardwoods. Um, those longleaf pine trees have a thick enough bark that they're not going to be uh, 
um, impacted by that burning. And, you know, it's not going to kill the trees, but what it will do is take out these hardwoods. It will consume all those fuels, the, the dead leaves on the ground, and, and, and be able to stimulate new things to be able to germinate and grow. So that's uh, what, uh, what that looks like. Um, and I mentioned, you know, it, it doesn't typically kill trees. Um, that's not always the case. There are instances where the fire will get a little bit hotter and will kill, you know, have a role in, 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 in killing some trees, but that's not actually frog is hopping along. It may come to a patch where there's there's not as many live trees, but we might see some of these dead a cluster of dead snags like this. And as a frog is hopping along, it might hear some different birds and, and, and other species, things like the red-headed woodpecker. This is one that actually does earn its name. You can see the red on its head, really beautiful bird with this tuxedo uh, kind of coloration of, of its body. Um, and it, like most of all the other woodpeckers in North Carolina, require dead trees in order to, to build their nests because these trees are now softer, easier to kind of drill through and excavate that cavity. Um, they'll also, because these things get, you know, a lot of beetles and, and other insects in them, that becomes a food source for the woodpeckers. Uh, these snags also are actually important for bats. So uh, um, you can see an image of a, of a big brown bat here, but as the bark starts to slough off, Bats can roost up inside underneath that sloughing bark. They can also nest in the, in the cavities and the hollows in the tree. And that's actually becoming a much more critical thing as bat populations across most of the United States have been decimated by a disease called white nose syndrome. It's uh, an exotic fungus that, uh, that, that gets on their, their, their muzzle around their nose and causes them to wake up during their hibernation during the cold months and then they uh, aren't able to get enough energy and they starve. And bat populations have just plummeted by you know over 90% in a lot of the the cave roosting sites where they typically met, you know uh, will hibernate in caves and have their maternity roosts uh, you know up in the mountains. And so places like in the sand hills where they can roost more you know in singles or in, in a few individuals under these trees, that actually becomes really critical because white nose syndrome does not spread as well when you'd only have just a few individuals there, and so they can stay free from that disease roosting in this type of habitat. Um, there's a lot of different species, as I said, that they there. And these woodpeckers serve as what we call keystone species because they alter the uh, the habitat in such a way that 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 it has a outsized effect um, to to support other species. So when the woodpecker, like in this case a hairy woodpecker, excavates a cavity in one of these trees, that cavity might in turn be used by something like a southern flying squirrel that uh, they they will uh, get in in these cavities. Screech owls um, will take advantage of it. Carolina chickadee. Um, there's reptiles like skinks, bluebirds, fox squirrels. Um, all these species can't excavate cavities of their own, but will take advantage of those that have been created by hairy woodpeckers or those red cockaded woodpeckers we saw before. And here's an image of uh, some of those uh, fox squirrels using an abandoned red cockaded woodpecker cavity. And these are the young juvenile fox squirrels that you see here. Um, interestingly, they're actually from the same litter. You know, fox squirrels can have all different kinds of colorations from black. like it may be being followed, um, as we can see here, our, our trusty technician holding the, the, the antenna as he follows uh, where that frog goes, uh, the closer he gets to, to the frog or when that antenna points in the direction where the frog is, 
he hears a louder beep when the antenna is pointing away. He hears a softer beep, or when he's farther away, he hears a softer beep, and that's how you know you're getting closer and being able to find exactly where that frog is going. So these real dense uh, streamhead pocosin spots, or drains on the landscape, are really critical habitat for uh, um, for, uh, for for a lot of different species. So you can see here that these have, uh, in contrast to to these uplands, which you know are, are very sort of nutrient poor and well drained. Um, you know the water kind of runs right through them, very sandy soils. These 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 next to the creeks accumulates a much more organic soils, and it supports a wider range of different wildflowers and grasses and other kinds of species. And it can also uh, uh, support other types of, uh, of frogs. Uh, so this one here, this gorgeous animal, is the pine barrens tree frog. It's our state state frog, state amphibian, and uh, the sound that it makes is is, is a call it sound sound like a ank 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 ank. I'll kind of give you an image of it here and go over. Ank 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 ank. Again, my poor imitation, but I'm doing the best I can here to give you a little bit of audio. Um, and that's what these guys sound like, and it's coming from uh, the shrubs and uh, other spots on this uh, in this um, streamhead pocosin habitat. Um, our gopher frog is actually hopping by some some of its uh, fellow insect eaters out there, uh, other predators that uh, that are on the forest floor in the form of these carnivorous plants. So. Uh, the longleaf pine ecosystem in southeastern North Carolina is really known for a lot of really unique special carnivorous plants, including the Venus flytrap that's seen here. Uh, it's a species that's found basically in southeastern North Carolina and northern uh, northeast South Carolina and nowhere else on the planet, in essentially a 90 mile radius of Wilmington. Um, so it's really unique to our part of the world, uh, famous for its ability to have these, you know, sort of you know, bear trap like, you know, uh, um, modified leaves that uh, when a fly gets on uh, one of these, uh, these these traps, it walks along and uh, the fly trap has has trigger hairs, little kind of hairs on it that uh, tell it when, 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 to, uh, when to trigger the trap. And what's sort of interesting is that the Venus fly trap is a plant that can count because if that hair trigger is, 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 is tripped just once, nothing happens. Trip twice, nothing happens. It's three or more times, that's the signal that it, it closes. And actually, the more times it's triggered in short succession, the faster it closes. And it does that to avoid, like, if just a leaf or another, uh, you know, branch or something, you know, you know, brush brushes against it, it doesn't want to have to close that trap and lose the opportunity to actually catch a real meal um, and only has limited times that that trap can close. And so it waits to, until it knows that there's something that's continuously hitting it, so there's something alive in there, and, and then it will, will close. Pitcher plants are another uh, type of uh, carnivorous plant. Um, here you can see a sea of these pitcher plants down at the Nature Conservancy Shaken Creek Preserve in, uh, in Pender County. Um, these uh, pitcher plants create these, these, uh, these funnels, places uh, that uh, um, you know, has basically a sweet smelling nectar in the bottom and flies and, and other things are, are attracted to kind of fly into that and go down. And then there's a bunch of backward facing hairs that prevent it from crawling back up and forces it downward, downward, downward until it hits the bottom and is, is dissolved in the juices at the bottom. And the plant is able to then absorb its nutrients and supplement um, its uh, the nutrients that can get from that otherwise nutrient poor soil. Well, after passing all of these different things, the red cockaded woodpeckers, the pine barrens, tree frogs, the Venus flytraps, the snags, all these things, it's finally fi going to arrive at the destination where it's headed. It started off from that stump hole. And it may be a few weeks later after we've had enough of those warm rainy nights when it finally arrives at a breeding pond. So it's looking for these isolated ephemeral wetlands, which are sort of a unique 
wetland type. Uh, when the term isolated means that they're not attached to a river source. It's not part of flowing water. They're just a bowl on the landscape that hold water. And ephemeral means that they're temporary. They don't hold water all year round. They dry out through parts of the year, and that'll be important for, for reasons that I'll, I'll let you know. So anyway, at the when they all these gopher frogs have gotten the signal from all the different ponds, they come at the at the right time. The males will start calling and look to start breeding with the females. And these ponds, you know, one of the reasons why it's important that they dry out is that that's part of their the ecology to allow them to grow all these grasses. You can see these emergent grasses coming up from the uh, from the wetland. Um, are really critical and they need some dry ground to, in order to germinate and also fire to stimulate them to grow and to knock back the uh, shrubs. So it's sort of a, an ironic thing that there's a wetland that depends on fire, but that's that's a true statement that when these things dry in the summertime, fire will go through them, rejuvenate them, allow these grasses and emerging things to grow, keep the trees out of them. And so you get this open water or, um, habitat with all these nice grasses and, and, and other herbs growing out of it. And those grasses and, 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 and such are important because that's where our gopher frog is going to attach its egg mass. This uh, right here is a gopher frog egg mass, which is about the size of a softball, which is really kind of wild when you think the frog itself is maybe only about the size of a baseball. Um, probably what happens is that those egg masses swell with, uh, with the water after they are laid by the females, but it's still it's an incredible investment of energy by that female to lay what's going to be hundreds of eggs in this big mass here that's now attached to these grasses anchored there. Um, here you can see a tiger salamander egg mass. Here, here's an image, underwater image now. So these are all grasses coming up from underneath the water. And then each of these sort of gelatinous things is a glob of a tiger salamander egg mass. And if you look at the close up, each of these little half moon slivers is a tiger salamander larvae that is uh, in the, uh, in there. And, uh, and so these grasses are important to be able to attach these egg masses to. And then when the tadpoles or, or salamander larvae hatch, they'll be able to hide in those from predators in those grasses and be able to eat, um, you know, from them as they grow. And the goal is to then eventually they'll, they'll stay in that pond for several months, um, long enough until they become a little froglet that is able to, you know, lose its uh, tadpole tail, grow its legs, and be able to emerge from that pond to be able to hop out go out and look to find a stump hole of its own and, and, and complete that, uh, that cycle of life. So all this, you know, incredible life cycle of the gopher frog depends on this really unique and special fire managed longleaf pine ecosystem. And this, so one of the things we've learned about is that this longleaf pine ecosystem is really special and, 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 and really unique, and we're lucky to have it here in our backyard in the, in the southeastern North Carolina. But it's also critical that it's, it's, it's really threatened and vulnerable. And if you're thinking, well, I don't see much of anything like that around the UNCP campus, or you know, we have a few longleaf trees, but nothing that looks quite like, like that. And it's, it's because of a lot of the threats that, uh, that will, uh, will degrade longleaf pine habitat or have altered it. So, one of the big things we've talked about is fire suppression. That as, as, as you get suppressed with fire, these things grow up and get very dense with a lot of hardwoods. You might see loblolly pines, and eventually actually the longleaf, you know, drop out of it and you can't even recognize it as a longleaf pine forest in the absence of fire. Um, so people have said that fire is to the longleaf forest what rain is to the rainforest. It is an essential element to, to make it work. Um, one of the biggest things is that what, you know, Robson County and, and most of southeastern North Carolina was covered in longleaf before, but now what we see is a lot of ag fields and 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 uh, you know houses and and you know um, other types of things. So we've converted, you know, we cut down all the all that longleaf and have uh, converted it to other land uses, so we don't see longleaf in those places. In other cases, we've taken it and converted it to lob, you know, loblolly pine or other short, you know quicker growing uh, pine species um, or other types of, uh, of, of, of forest products. We've taken fire out of it. So these incompatible forestry practices also degraded it. And then to some extent, we have ex exotic species. Uh, in this image, what you see is love grass. Uh, so it actually looks like you got a lot of grassy ground cover, but in this instance, it's an exotic species of, of love grass that then sort of chokes out everything else. You just have that one species, nothing else, and very little room to to move at ground level. 
So there's a variety of different threats that, uh, that impact longleaf pine. And so the net effect of, of that has been to, um, by, by longleaf pine being threatened by all these things, what we see is, is, is a real diminishment of these species that depend on it. So this map that you can see here is a map of the counties of In, uh, in, the, in this part of the county. And all these blue triangles are, you know, from the results of these statewide surveys we've done, the places where Bachman sparrow, the species that we see right here in the lower corner, places where they still occur. So you can see, you know, there's a good cluster of them in areas in, in the sand hills, a few scattering and blowing lakes, and a few patches along the coast. Um, you look at the distribution of red cockaded woodpecker, you start seeing a very similar pattern. A bunch of them in the sand hills, a few in the Blake Lakes region, and then patchy areas um, in the lower coastal plain. Gopher frogs, we've just learned about. There's really just these, these green dots represent the gopher frog places. There's about eight locations left in the state. You know, again, as for context, these species would have once been found across almost the entirety of all of eastern North Carolina, all the way up to the Virginia border. Longleaf covered all of this area. Fire managed this, uh, you know, this, this whole landscape. And now we're seeing it in just these, these handful of spots. You know, if I were to, uh, you know, overlay, you know, this is just three species, but if I were to overlay maps for pygmy rattlesnake, pine, uh, pine snake, southern hognose snake, sandhills lily, venus flytrap, all these other species, it would be a very similar pattern. And the fact that they're clumping together in similar places is, is not an accident. Um, these green polygons, and I've now put behind um, the images here, are the conservation lands, lands that have been protected and are now managed for conservation in some form. So these are places like you can see labeled here in the Sand Hills Fort Bragg, uh, 150,000 acre, you know, military reservation, but they, they, they are managing it to maintain that longleaf ecosystem, which is important both for the military training and for these species. Uh, Sand Hills Game Land, where we, the study happened, you can see here. Um, down on the coast, you have Croatan National Forest, Camp Lejeune, and another military base, Holly Shelter Game Land, um, Orton Plantation, Military Ocean Terminal, Sunny Point. Um, so these conservation lands are critical as the places where all these rare species are found. And if you look at all that white space in between it, that's where we don't have conservation lands and you're not seeing very many of these species. So you might say, okay, in our backyard here in Robeson County, what's going on? Well, unfortunately, we haven't had as many of these sort of conservation lands, these lands that are being managed with fire and protected. And we see that we don't really have any extant records, you know, current records of red cockaded woodpeckers, Bachman sparrows, gopher frogs, or a lot of these other species. So there's a need and an opportunity for restoration that, that could happen in, the, in this area here. So it's become rare and unique. And the Nature Conservancy, the agency that I work for, is an organization that's dedicated to trying to address and reverse these, these, these uh, the loss of, uh, you know, the, 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 the challenges of the loss of biodiversity and climate change, which, which is another exasperating factor. So how does the TNC work? Well, we are a land trust, so one of the things we do is protect land. We'll buy land to uh, try and keep it from being developed, and we'll get it put into uh, often public ownership, so state parks, um, game lands, other places where you can visit and enjoy uh, our lands that, that have been protected by nature conservancy. We also restore the habitat there. We do a lot of the controlled burning, planting longleaf, controlling invasive species, all these things that are necessary to enhance and have good habitat quality, um, a big part of our focus. We have a water program and climate initiatives that are uh, working on a lot of these big picture issues that, that, that are cross cutting bigger than just longleaf pine. Um, we'll go about these doing things like informing policy at the national level and the state level, trying to get good policy and funding for all this work. And we also conduct a lot of sci sound science. So, you know, again, my position is as an applied scientist, and I'll do research projects and, and surveys and monitoring to be able to evaluate so we can know that our limited conservation dollars and effort are going, you're going to have the maximum bang for the buck. We're going to have the biggest impact and do the right things in the right places to, to help those, those biodiversity and climate crises. I'd like to talk for a moment, uh, you know, UNC Pembroke is a really important, valuable uh, institution 
um, in in uh, support of education of, of a lot of our Native American tribes and partners. So I want to talk about how the Nature Conservancy, where we are collaborating with, you know, the various tribes, uh, in particular the Waccamaw, Suan, Lumbee, and Kohari tribes in southeastern North Carolina that, that overlap with the Longleaf Range. Um, we have a Venus flytrap project with the Waccamaw, Suan, looking to restore some habitat, be able to grow out Venus flytraps and actually provide opportunities for the tribe to maybe be able to sell this species whose historic range actually overlaps really closely with the range that uh, that the tribe um, used to um, inhabit across uh, North and South Carolina. Um, we had a, a, a project with, uh, with, with the Lumbee. Um, you see here Kevin Milner in a dugout canoe uh, helped him to source a tree on, on the TNC preserve, a nice old growth um, lava lolly pine that was cut down and he, he, he did a fantastic job of creating this hollowed out canoe and just recently in the last few weeks had a, a launching ceremony uh, on the, uh, uh, at the cultural center there in Robinson County for this uh, dugout canoe project. Um, the uh, museum, uh, Nancy Fields and the Museum for the Southeastern uh, American Indian uh, are, 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 are leading projects, you know, about looking at the connections between the native people and, and, and waterways, and also looking at how to reconnect with land and waters and providing access to um, nature conservancy preserves where historic medicinal plants and food plants, things like you see sassafras pictured here, which would form a sassafras tea and used in some medicinal uses, um, provide access to those sort of traditional plants. Um, a preserve history project, again, working with the Museum of the Southeast American Indian to research what, who are the people that were, were using some of these preserves that the Nature Conservancy has now, and how do we tell that story so people know it and understand it. Uh, controlled burn training and support, we've recently got some funding that's going to allow the, uh, um, the Waccamaw Suan and Lumbee tribes to be able to start building capacity within the tribe for controlled burning, burning, you know, of, 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 for, for uh, their own private lands and, 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 and uh, the, the community owned properties and, and bringing that important uh, practice, which was really affected by native peoples over time, um, you know, back into a, a modern practice. Uh, also providing, you know, opportunities for controlled burning jobs and, and, and different career paths to get into, into conservation. So I think there's, there's great opportunities for collaboration um, in a lot of those ways and other forms that we're doing longleaf pine restoration uh, projects. So now speaking to the students who, who may be listening, wanted to talk uh, for a quick minute about uh, different pathways to a career in conservation. If you've been thinking about uh, wanting to go into how do you protect the environment, how do you address you know, some of these issues, how do you, how do you care for those gopher frogs and, 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 and pine barrens, tree frogs and, and, and red cockaded woodpeckers, uh, I wanted to give you, you know, a few tips and, and, and words of advice about it. Um, so certainly, though, you know, those of you who are pursuing a, a degree, uh, looking to get a degree in natural resource management or policy um, can, can be valuable, uh, but it doesn't have to necessarily be ecology. There's, you know, biology or, or you know, botany, these kinds of things, uh, learning about, uh, you know, um, political um, you know, theory, learning about, uh, you know, engineering policy. There's lots of different ways to enter, you know, the environmental field, sustainability, um, communications. Um, a master's degree can help for those of you who are undergrads, thinking about where you go from here. Um, there are jobs that are available to people that just have a, a bachelor's degree. Um, if you do get a master's, you know, a lot of the, you know, conservation jobs in state agencies like the Wildlife Commission and Nature Conservancy, a master's type level often helps. If you're going to want on to academia, obviously you want to go all the way to, to get a PhD, um, but, you know, there's, there's various levels. So learn about what is needed in the, in the particular outcome you want to have. Key thing I'd say is get experience. You know, when I'm looking at resumes, when I'm reviewing, you know, to hire folks, I like seeing, you know, what, what, what classwork they've had, but what really is going to kind of key into me is, you know, didn't, is this someone who's got dirt under their fingernails? Have they had real world experience either, you know, doing something, you know, getting into practice? Will they be able to understand what it takes to do, you know, field work? So find opportunities to volunteer, do internships, get, get you know, see things, you know, on the ground because that's going to be critical. So some examples of where you can do that actually with the Nature Conservancy. We have volunteers that work with us to do wiregrass seed collecting in the fall. We'll go out, be able to identify plants, collect seed that are used in restoration projects. 
Uh, for those who want to get uh, invest a little bit more, we actually can take volunteers that that uh, will be on our controlled burns. It's a little bit more of an investment of of training and needing to pass a fitness test to do that. Um, but there's a pathway to that. Um, getting involved in professional societies can be critical. Here I show one example is the Wildlife Society is an organization for wildlife biologists, but there's others for those who uh, are interested in plants or uh, um, you know, other aspects of the field that sort of provide opportunities for um, networking, to be learning more about what's happening in the profession. Uh, the Wildlife Society has a mentoring program that matches students and early career professionals with established professionals to get some of that real world experience and, and, and networking. Um, they also have grant programs that they can help fund if you want to go to a conference, if you want to do a uh, you know little um, undergraduate research project, if you want to be able to go and do those things, there's actually funding that can support you there. So a lot of good advantages to joining professional societies. And then finally, a few of the skills to be thinking about. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know if you want to be a researcher, you got to learn those research skills. How to identify animals? How do you know work with radio transmitters? All these you know. Uh, um, di different, you know, sort of hard skills, but um, there's a couple of universal skills that I'll highlight for you that, that, that are going to be broadly useful, you know, and across a wide area. So, so spoken and written communication, being a good communicator is essential to, to, uh, to doing this work. It's not just about counting bugs and, and plants and, and that type of thing. A lot of us who go into this field are introverts and like to just be kind of left alone with our animals, but being able to be able to to share that 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 knowledge and, and and be able to you know convince other people about the importance and value of this thing is is, is really important. So spoken written communication, um, GIS, geographic information systems. We use a lot of that. It's it's a, um, for those who are not familiar. It's it's basically an, um, you know computer based mapping and data analysis system that allows you to collect information in the field. And be able to analyze it and create maps and do other things with it. Um, use it across a wide variety of things, get some knowledge base with that. Obviously, just general knowledge of ecology and natural systems, you know, knowing about the, you know, the ecosystem around you, use of different tools and equipment specific to you. And then and finally, I've mentioned a couple of times networking, um, getting to know different people, learning, you know, others in the profession really helps to uh, to, to get your career started. So with that, um, I'd like to stop here and provide an opportunity for those of you who might have some, some questions or thoughts or ideas or reactions to uh, the, uh, the presentation that you saw today, um, give you a chance to either come off of mute or perhaps use uh, the chat if Elizabeth, you are monitoring the chat function and I'll maybe stop the share so that we can uh, have this, and if you wanted to even, you know, come off onto video for asking a question, uh, you know, I encourage you to do that. Uh, hey, Jeff, how you doing? My name's Wesley. Um, I was wondering, could you uh, give me the name of uh, some of those professional societies you mentioned? Botany Society? Yeah, so uh, the Wildlife Society is um, is a uh, is an organization. I believe the website is is uh, um, wildlife.org, and there's a state chapter which would be nctws.org. So if you're interested in wildlife, wildlife biology, um, those are two excellent sources. Uh, the the state chapter nctws.org. Um, it only costs ten dollars a year to join. There's local meetings. That's the ones that have the the, the, the grants and scholarships and, and uh, mentor program um, for plants. If you're interested in, there's a few of them. Um, there's the North Carolina Native Plant Society. Um, that's as much sort of plant enthusiasts. So it'll be sort of lay people as well as, as as like professional botanists that are in that. Likewise with Friends of Plant Conservation. So if you look up uh, Google Friends of Plant Conservation or Native Plant Society. Those are two good ones. Um, if you're into fisheries and aquatics, there's an organization called the American Fisheries Society. Um, if you're into just general conservation, there's the Society for Conservation Biology. Um, so I could go through a number of other uh, ones that are that are out there, but kind of depending on your specific interest, 
if you just simply actually type in, you know, what's your topic areas of interest and professional society after it, you'll probably pull up a number of different options that are out there. And most of these societies have reduced or fairly reasonable rates for students, you know, to be able to join because they really are encouraging and wanting to support students to, uh, to get involved. Um, does that answer your question or are there some specific ones that you had in your mind? Uh, no, that answers my questions. Thanks so much for your time. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, definitely encourage you to check those out because that's a great way, a great pathway just to kind of explore and see is this even a thing that you'd be interested in. Policy, you know, opportunities to like go to meetings, go to you know join these societies that that have work groups around these things or doing some field work can give you a chance to you know really experience it and say, boy, yeah, I love it. I want to do more of this, or no, boy, this is miserable. I hate control burning. I'm never going to do this again. You wouldn't really know it if you don't try it. So, anyway, um, thanks for that question, Wesley. Jeff, uh, this is David. I'm librarian here, faculty librarian. I hope you can hear me. I can, thanks. Uh, my parents used to live in Seven Lakes, and you're talking about the longleaf pine and all that and the cockaded woodpecker. Oftentimes, there'll be these triangular signs on those trees. Is that put out by the Nature Conservancy to basically recognize those trees that should not be cut down because of the cockaded or communities are putting those up? So it'll be probably the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a federal agency, you know, dedicated to wildlife uh, conservation, and they're the ones that enforce the Endangered Species Act. So it's the Endangered Species Act that provides protections for the red cockaded woodpecker, a federally, currently federally endangered species proposed to be downlisted to a federally threatened species, so still getting federal protections, but recognizing that it's making some recovery. But anyway, it's Fish and Wildlife Service that will post uh, those signs, and that's, yeah, exactly what it says. It says, basically, please do not cut down this tree. Well, you should not cut down this tree because it would, in fact, violate the Endangered Species Act to destroy the woodpecker's habitat. Um, and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, though, what you see is that sometimes those cavity trees are left, but when too many of the other trees that don't have cavities in them are cut down around an area, their birds might still have their cavity to live in, but they don't have enough places to forage, enough places to find food, enough places to find new cavities when that other one goes out. So you'll sometimes lose that that cluster of birds, um, even when the uh, the you know the cavity trees are still there. But yes, that's that's fish and wildlife that post those signs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jeff. I have a question. Yes. Um, so if you're not aware, UNCP does have certain classes that look for service learning opportunities where they would take their class out and do some sort of um, community support project, like a physical actual project uh, that would relate to their class. Do you think that there are any opportunities for um, a class of students? Would there be any um, thing that the Nature Conservancy would like to encourage classes to come out and do service learning projects. Do you think that that would be something that uh, the Conservancy would support? So yes, you know, basically we'd want to make sure that it would match up in terms of, you know, where we have some of the needs. So I mentioned wiregrass seed collecting. That's something that happens in the fall when the seed is ripe and ready. So if we have classes, if it's a fall class and it would be around that, uh, um, Kind of November-ish time frame, you know, late October to to you know uh, November, early December. Um, we could get classes out helping with that. You know, maybe later in the winter or the early spring semester. Um, we sometimes will do longleaf tree planting. So as long as we can get it planned far enough ahead of time, and we have a need like to plant trees or to collect grass seed, you know, we can do that. But the other thing that we can do is actually craft and create some new you know sort of projects that would be tailored to these classes that would provide some learning.
all collaborate in a group called the Sand Hills Conservation Partnership. And this uh, partnership, it uh, meets, meets quarterly, they have different meetings, and they also have a way of communicating out. So if there's a professor that wants to take their class out and the TNC doesn't have a good project that would be match, what we could do is actually advertise that out to the whole partnership so that you'd have a couple dozen organizations that would learn about you know this this need and maybe we would find a better match so yes if if someone is uh, if there's a professor if there's a class that's interested you can have them start by getting in touch with me and i know you've got my contact information that you can share um and i can help get them plugged into you know the, the right place amazing excellent thank you very much mm -hmm. Is the uh, is the conservancy doing anything specifically with carnivorous plants at this point, or is it just nestled in along with the long leaf pine conservation? So yeah, our biggest effort would be, you know, by trying to protect the entire long leaf pine ecosystem. We we as much as possible try and take an ecosystem management approach, but because particularly the Venus flytrap is becoming so rare and it is so unique, we we are focused have some things that are focused on it. So if there's a property that we may be trying to acquire and it has Venus flytraps on it, that becomes a higher priority for us for us to put our money in and, and, and to make sure that we're going to buy that land and try and restore it. Um, we have some some uh, some some uh, long-term monitoring plots that are focused specifically on Venus flytrap and counting their populations and being able to track what happens uh, you know over time and how they respond to management. Uh, we played a role in, in uh, getting a, a new law that was passed that actually um, provides some certain fines for people who poach Venus flytraps, you know, who collect them from the wild to sell them and degrading populations. So we'll, we'll work on the policy level, work on research. We'll target a lot of our management and protection specifically where we know it's going to help Venus flytraps. Um, so there is some targeted work like that, but for the most part, we try and have it, if we're doing a good job of managing for the ecosystem, then fly traps will benefit alongside the pitcher plants, alongside the, all the different orchids and the wire grass and the, and the woodpeckers and everything else. Good question, thank you. Well, the rule of thumb is, is, is to give like 10 seconds of uh, awkward silence to allow the space for people to jump in. And uh, um, if you don't hear it from that, that might be a uh, trigger that there are no questions. So uh, um, if you're still shy and wanted to kind of jump in, uh, last opportunity here. But uh, if, if, if not, then I'm going to uh, say my last word of thanks to, to all of you for attending, to Elizabeth for you making this possible. Um, provide my apologies again for that little delay at the beginning to have to get the videos re uh, re re equipped and the um, and the audio uh, working. You would think it'd get all this technical uh, problems worked out by now, but uh, I should add that to my list of uh, skills that you should develop for here is uh, technical uh, PowerPoint abilities where I'm I'm, I'm clearly failing. But um, I'll pause for one last moment for any last questions, and then maybe turn it back to Elizabeth for any for the last thoughts. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming. We enjoyed having you on campus in person. So feel free to reach out to me if you have um, further de developments on, let's say, the Venus flytrap pro project that you would like to come back and talk about it maybe in the spring. Um, we really appreciate you uh, sharing your knowledge and insight. But I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here. Um,